take your Bibles out and let's get ready to enjoy another study of God's Word. services alive and people connect with us from around the world. I want you to know you're in the right place at the right time. The presence of the Lord is here right now. And I welcome you to the auditorium of Word of Deliverance and Ministries for the world. We trust God. We believe God. We worship the Lord. We've come to praise the Lord. And we encourage you to praise the Lord along with us today. I found out the more you praise Him. He loves an atmosphere that has been properly prepared. And with our praise and our worship and our prayers, we have prepared an atmosphere that the Lord may move and have his way. So on behalf of the entire family of Word of Deliverance Ministries for the World in Forest Park, a suburb of Greater Cincinnati, Ohio, welcome to the Word. Give everybody a hand. Come on. Today we are tremendously blessed. It's amazing how the Lord allows us to meet people from all over the world, meet some of his greatest teachers and preachers and servants literally from all over the world. And today we have a preacher here that we recognize as one of our brothers. Amen. Amen. And we love him. You know him. He's no stranger to us. And so we're not going to act like we are introducing some new person that you don't know. You already know him. And I'm just glad to be presenting unto you our dear brother, Elder Rick. We call him Soup Campbell. Give him a hand as he comes. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Bishop. I greet you, sir. And your beautiful, wonderful, precious wife, our sister, Dr. Valda. And I have, like many others, grown acclimated to being able to greet and to see the Hilton's mother and father. And I, I can't see them anymore. But I am thankful, along with others who are here, that I do get to see the beautiful young lady, Mother Bostick. And I greet you today. <laughs> that the media department would help me for a couple seconds. I have something to share with you. Praise the Lord, Bishop Hilton. And to my beautiful, lovely, gorgeous, 
sister in the Lord, Dr. Valda Hilton, and to Mother Bostic, I send my love to the saints and friends today. I'm sorry I cannot be there, but I know you're all going to have a high time in the Lord. Love you. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> I want you to pray for me today that the Lord helps me, and I also want you to pray for me that my wife does not carry out a threat that she gave to me, that if I ever come back here without her again, she's going to do something to me. So, I tried to tell her, or well, Bishop called me and it just happened. She said, I don't care how it happens. You are not going back to the Word without me. Dr. Bowder, you, you're a little too loud with that, Dr. Bowder. You're a little, a little too emphatic. But I, I, except for being in dangerous places where I serve and rescue people, I want to be with my wife everywhere. Everywhere. And I am happy about that. I, I, I love your pastors, and I love the ministerial staff, and I love all of you. I love my family. I love a lot of friends all over the world and individuals that I, I know. But I don't call anyone my best friend except Denise. Now, I'm not saying y'all can't have best friends. I'm telling y'all what I do. That, that is my best friend. So I'm sorry that she can't be here, but I thank her for praying for me. Ezekiel chapter number 37. And St. John chapter number one. I am thankful that the Lord blessed Bishop and Dr. Bowder to go to Detroit and to represent and to be a part of the celebration for an American icon and legend that touched and affected people all over the world. And we can, we can get lost and even the media can get lost in the gifting that God gave Aretha Franklin to sing and we're not just talking singing gospel we're not just talking about singing what we call secular music but we're also talking about classical music and we can get lost in that because she was so gifted even beyond our words and we can forget that this woman was a blessing to all of us who are in here today, black, white, Italian, Russian, whatever you are here today or listening to this program, that this woman helped to break down racial barriers. This woman fought for civil rights, equal rights. She put her life and career on the line. And we can never forget that someone has to step forward and be willing to sacrifice. Someone has to suffer ridicule. Someone has to get hit with tomatoes or bricks or be bitten by police dogs. Someone has to go through that. Someone even has to give their life in order for someone else to live. So I am thankful that God blessed them to go. And I know that you are word but you should be thankful and honored that you have a man and a woman that lead this ministry who can represent you properly in public around the world. Amen. Because the reality is we've got some female and male thugs and crooks in pulpits. Some of you are a part of the word today because you wanted to get away from one of those ministers. Aren't you glad that you're no longer there and that you're a part of the word? And you can hold 
All right, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 3, verse number 8. And then St. John chapter 1, and all of these are short, we can take these together. Ezekiel, one of those books in the Old Testament that does not get much action from us. He says in verse number three, and this is, this starts with verse number one and two, but he gets to verse number three, and there's some communication from God. And he said unto me, together, son of can and I, O oh Lord, thou knowest. And verse number eight. And I be, and lo, the, and the, came up upon them, and the, the conjunction, but, in St. John chapter one, Familiar, verse number one, we start there, with the beginning. In the beginning was the, and the word was, and the word the same. All things were, and without him was not, that was made. And that's far as we're going in verse three. Sometimes I do what Bishop and the rest of the ministers in here do, those in the pulpit, those who are sitting over here, various places. We, we question God about what he wants us to preach. We, we do that. We question God about what he wants us to do, what he wants us to say. And that's fine. It just has to be done with the proper respect and reverence to God. And part of it is because we are dealing with the spirituality and the humanity. And we struggle with things. Even Jesus in the garden himself, he struggled. I, I want to save them. I want to save these people. I want to deliver. I want to, to bring about salvation for them. But is there another way that I can do it without going to this cross? I want to save them. I just don't want to be separated from you. We talk about the cross. We talk about the beating. We talk about the blood and the birds pecking his eyes out. We talk about the, the soldiers and the abuse that they did to him and, and the spitting on him and slapping him around. We, we talk about him being stretched and, and then and the nails going into him and the sword going into his side. We talk about all that pain. We talk about all of that. We talk about the, the difficulty that had to be there when the sin of the world then and all the sins to come were dropped on him. We talk about how terrible all of that was. And it is true. The communion is going to take place today. This communion is birthed by what he went through at Calvary. But none of those things that I described, listen, none of those things that I described were really painful. What was painful was when God left him. That, he didn't, when, when they were beating him, when they put the nails in him, he didn't cry out, my God. But when God left, when God pulled back and left him, my God, my God. You and I can go through anything, endure anything, if God is there. But when, you, when I feel like you've left me, 
You and I have experienced some moments where it felt like God was not there. You're reaching for him. You're trying to find him. And that's horrible. And you start, Lord, what do I have to do to get, do I have to take communion? Do I have to repent? What do I have to do? Because you don't ever want to not feel God's presence. You always want to feel God making a hair crawl on the back of your neck. You always want to feel God when you're driving down the car, the, the truck rolling your car. You always want to feel God when you're at home by yourself. And you are in prayer for somebody else. You ain't asking for no money. You ain't asking for your toe to be healed. You ain't asking God to help no child. You're praying for somebody else. And you're agonizing in prayer. And you're leaning on the couch or on the bed. And then on the other side, you feel the couch sink down beside you. As if God is saying, I'm right here beside you. I'm right here with you. You want to always feel him and know he's there. But when God backs away and you're by yourself, your Uncle Festus and your Aunt Maggie can't help you then. That's when you go to God and say, Lord, I don't want you to leave me. So we have questions. And on a communion Sunday, this message, I know it's from God, but I still have questions. But that's not going to stop me from doing some damage to the devil. I want to speak to you from a message that is titled, The Resurrection of the Dead. Bishop, when he was up here, just spoke about death. We were talking about Lady Aretha Franklin. I mentioned his legendary and wonderful parents who caused the gospel from this house to go all over the world. Their son and Dr. Bowden in Paris not long ago. Some of you who have traveled like I have, we've gone places that our parents never dreamed of. And that's one of the reasons why we should do whatever we can for our mothers and fathers. Don't, don't be a bad child. Don't be a child that's not appreciative. Don't be a child that acts like, yeah, but I got a college degree and you ain't made it to the fifth grade. That's because I was keeping you alive. That's why you were able to go to college. I suffered for you. My mother would not let us pick cotton when we would go south from Ohio in the summertime because she had to do it for a little bit and she said, then she learned how to cook. She said, I told my grandmother, I want to help you cook so I can be in the house. I don't want to go in the cotton field anymore. But my mother determined, none of you, when you come south for the summer, you're not going to ever pick cotton. You can work out there on the farm. You can kill the hogs. You can pull up the sugar cane, you can do other things, but you're not. So they went through things for me, and as a result, my mother and father did not graduate from high school. I have three older brothers and sisters. They did not graduate from high school. I was the first one in the family to graduate high school, to go to college, to get a degree. But it wasn't because I was so smart, it's because somebody else suffer for me to have an opportunity to shine and I determined I'm not going to blow it. If I'm standing on your shoulders, I am not going to blow it. I'm not going to be some fool, some idiot who's going to school for free and can use a calculator in school and flunk math class. It's not going to happen. So when that depth is there for others, when there's doomed situations for others, when there are problems for others, and God graces me and you to have a resurrection to bring us back from death, from doom, from the brink of destruction, back from things that are in our body and sickness, when God blesses us to be able to have us hear his voice. It's 
it's a blessing to be able to hear from God. It, it's not, this ain't no just church stuff. When God can speak to you when you're in the middle of Macy's, when God can speak to you when someone is telling you that you're being fired, when God can speak to you and tell you to stop your car when the light is green on your side, when God can speak to you and you hear it, that is a blessing. Because God knows a truck is coming through the intersection. God knows how to keep you alive. Let us hear when God speaks. Sometimes God is telling you, shut your mouth and you can keep your job. Sometimes we just keep on talking. Well, I'm a miller and we millers don't shut up. And you millers don't have a job either. Study to be quiet, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Sometimes the loudest thing you can say is nothing. Ezekiel the prophet. According to Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse number 1, it is the 30th year, the fourth month of the year, in the fifth day, and he is down by the river of Kiba. And something tremendous happens that everybody in the world wants. God does something. He communicates with this man, look at this, who is in captivity. He, he's, he's not in the risk column. He's not in word of deliverance. He's been snatched from his homeland. They're in chains. They have been told not to worship the way they normally worship. When you Today, we were in the spirit of worship. Thank you, Lord. We're able to freely worship in here. They can't do it in some parts of Pakistan, in China, and other places. But you can lift up your hands, and you can give God glory. You can open your mouth and give God praise. You can say Jesus as many times as you want and nobody's trying to kill you. They're not going to put you in jail. You have freedom and we often don't take advantage of it. I don't feel like saying amen right now. I don't feel like saying hallelujah right now. But do you feel like being blessed right now? Do you feel like being delivered right now? Do you feel like God giving you money right now? Do you feel like God protecting your child right now? Do you feel like God looking out for you now for what's going to happen in three hours and he's going to keep you alive? Do you feel like giving God some praise, some worship, some adoration? Do you feel like thanking God for giving you a resurrection from dead works from backward stuff, do you feel like giving God up? Because if you really feel like it, you don't need us to tell you to do it all the time. You don't need the choir to be singing to you and pumping you up. You don't need a guitar playing and the drums going on. When I wake up, I will say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all oh, that is within me. I didn't have to get up. And I didn't have to be able to move when I got up. I didn't have to have food when I got up. I didn't have to have respect when I got up. God couldn't let folks see what I did last week. But he covered it by the blood, by his grace and his mercy. Aren't you glad God doesn't reveal to other people all the stuff that you and I have done wrong? God covers stuff. Because God knows you acted a fool, but there's still good stuff in you, and he's not going to let that kill you and destroy you. And some of the stuff that you have done, God resurrects it from the dead. Yes, you had a child when you were 15 years old. Yes, you went to jail, and it was all in the newspaper. Yes, someone saw you at the strip club. Yes! You were cussing them out and didn't know that somebody else was watching or that they had the video on like the sister back there videotaping. I'm going to make sure I say the right thing. <laughs> so you didn't know it. But God said, I'm not going to let this destroy you. I'm going to let you use 
the fact that you had a child at 15 years old to be able to stand up and give a testimony about what God can do for you. And that child that I had at 15 is in college now. That child that I had at 15 has just gone to become a great technician. That child that I had was able to give me a kidney when I was about to die. There are wonderful things that God can bring out of your mistakes. He can resurrect your stuff from the dead. Never be ashamed to talk about what you used to do. The devil wants you to keep your mouth. No, I ain't. I'm going to act like I ain't never did nothing in my life. No, yes, I did wrong, but look what the blood of Jesus has done in my life. Look what the Holy Ghost did in my life. Look how God delivered me. And he can save you and you and you because God did it for me. And there was nothing the devil could do to stop it. That's one of the things that I love about this. God, God, not like the Cincinnati Bengals, not like the Cincinnati Reds, God tells the, the opposing team, the devil, all of his stuff. He shows him what he's going to do. You don't do that with other teams. The football team's playing today, they're not going to say, okay, look, here, here's our playbook. You can go ahead and read it, and we'll see you on the field. But God tells the devil exactly what he's going to do. In Genesis 3.15, he talks about the seed of the woman. This is the, the, the Greek, the Protevangelium. It is the first mention of Jesus Christ coming to be our Savior. God tells the devil, I'm coming. See if you can stop. He, he tells him how he's going to come. Isaiah 7.14, 9, 6. Behold, a virgin shall be with y'all, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Tells him his name. Give him all of it. Tells him his address. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Gives him everything. Now see if you can stop me. And when I get there, I'm going to save ungodly, no good, run down, non-deserving people who never prayed right in their life, but at this moment, they're going to pray right, they're going to repent right, they're going to do right, because I'm going to fill them with the power of the Holy Ghost. There was nothing the devil could do to stop you from getting the Holy Ghost. Whatever day you got it, the devil couldn't stop you. God gave you a resurrection from the dead. I'm so glad that the devil has a job. His job is to fight you and me, to fight this man and woman. Our job is to win. That's, the devil got a job, I got a job. He fights, I win. Yeah, y'all caught it now. That's right. You are a winner. You are a winner. You are a winner. You are a winner. You don't lose. Yes, you had a bruise. A bruise don't mean lose. A bruise mean I got evidence of what I went through. But the fact that I can stand here today says I have been resurrected from the dead. And I'll never stop talking about Jesus. I'll never stop praising him. I'll never stop worshiping him. I'll never stop adoring him. Never. Grown man, worship God. Woman, worship God. Child, worship God. Let the balcony worship God. So Ezekiel, you in captivity. You've been here, listen now, for 30 years years. How long can you endure something? The, the, the devil, they in captivity, 30 years, and still trusting God. And in captivity, this is what the man says in chapter 1 and verse 1. He's down by the river of Kibar, and he says, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. 
You don't have to be at church on communion day. You don't have to be on a 22-day fast. You don't have to be around all of the folks who are going to church in limousines and Rolls Royces. You don't have to be where all the cameras are with the Aretha Franklin or the John McCain funeral. You don't have to be there. You can be in a bad state. You can be in captivity. You can be in one of the worst parts of your life and God can still visit you. God ain't waiting for all your stuff to be fixed. He's busting right up in your stuff and saying, I'm right here. I'll give you vision from God. I'll visit you in your captivity. He got visions of God. And when God gives you those visions, many times you stand up and you say, now I know that I can make it. Yeah, but, but your body is riddled with the disease. But, but God said that I was going to make it. But, but the doctor said there's nothing else they can do. That's true. But God said, when God gives you a vision, you hold on to that vision. You hold on to that faith. You step out there. Uh, I'm not walking good right now, but Thursday is coming. That's right. I know I don't look so good to you now, but I'm telling you, what, sometimes you're in night school, and people don't believe you're doing anything, and you're in night school, and then... October the 3rd comes around and you're walking across the stage graduating with a master's degree. I didn't know you went to school, that's right. You didn't have to know, but I knew that God had given me visions. So God's talking to him again in chapter 37 and he says, again unto me, he says, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel, listen to me. Bishop, help the people out. You can deal with it more in Bible class. Ezekiel, listen folks, is not in a graveyard. That's what has been said for many years. He ain't in a graveyard. He's in exactly what the Bible says he is. He's in a valley of dry bones. He ain't in no graveyard because in a graveyard, the neck bone is connected to the foot bone, and the ankle bone connected to the stomach bone, and, and the tongue bone is connected to the elbow bone. In a, in, a, in a graveyard, bones and skeletons are connected. Nothing was connected here. He ain't in a graveyard. He's in a place of massacre. He's in a place of utter death. He's in a place of nothing but destruction. There's bones everywhere and, and dry bones, but nothing is connected. He's just out there where there has just been an absolute mess made of individuals' lives. You're just dead. There's just death. There is no, listen now, there is no hope of resurrection. We can't even find the right bone. Does that bone go to her or to him? We don't know. Is that, a, is that the bone for the horse or is that the bone for the man? We don't know. It's just a valley full of bones. And these people who are dead, this picture of so much destruction, God speaks to a man, a regular human being, and says, son of man, can these bones live? You have your master's degree. You've got 17 associates. You've got three earned PhDs. You can deal with hypervolemic shock and stress-induced arrhythmias. But can you tell me, with all of your brilliance, you got an IQ of 306, can these bones live? And Ezekiel gives the answer that all of us should give. Oh, Lord God, thou knowest. There are things, don't act like you know the answer. Don't act like you know how to explain the ridiculous blessing that Bishop was talking about. Don't act like you know how your house got paid off because you got an amortization schedule and you went. Don't act like you know how it happened. 
I don't know how God paid my house off. I don't know how my car didn't flip over. I don't know how I didn't die when I was in the accident. I don't know how my son is still in college. I don't know how the hair grew back on my head. I don't know how the back pain disappeared. I don't know how God gave me the man, the woman, the blessings that God gave me. But I do know how to thank him for what he did. I know how to thank the Lord, bless the Lord, worship the Lord. I know that. I know that whatever happens, God is responsible. And Ezekiel gives God the only answer that could be given. Oh, Lord God, thou knowest how are you going to come back from this, Lord, you know. Even though God does resurrect things, I, I've, I've got to say this again. I'm, I'm thankful for Bishop and Dr. Valda. Now, y'all know that I, I love God enough and I'm straightforward enough that if somebody is a criminal trying to be a minister, I'm going to bust you out. So I ain't saying stuff about them trying to cover something up and make it sound good. But aren't you glad that God gives you a man and woman that can represent again with dignity, with honor, with class, not getting out of jail, not acting a fool on TV, not doing crazy stuff? There are a lot of individuals that I love and respect. But when we talk about Aretha Franklin and respect, we had some things that we saw on television recently. And our young ladies need to be respected. Especially as clerks. Stephanie, my daughter that Denise and I didn't give birth to. Jermaine, our son that Denise and I didn't give birth to. Your daughter, your son that we didn't give birth to, your grandchild that we didn't give birth to, they must be safe in my presence. You must know that if I'm around them, I'm going to respect them, I am going to love them, I am going to minister to them, I am going to give prayer for them, I am the, that they're going to be safe so that we respect God enough to present ourselves properly, especially when the cameras are on. Because it is my job to make sure that if I'm waiting on your daughter after church, that you know nothing is going to happen that's funny. He ain't going to do anything because he will die for this child. And I'm saying I'm glad that your pastor does not do stuff that make people question his integrity, his holiness, his righteousness, that the world has nothing except praise for your leadership. It is a blessing when white men and women do the right thing. It is a blessing to live holy. I know we don't want to talk about holy living, righteous spirit, but you better be holy. You better have a right spirit. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Valda. And I know that we can make mistakes, but some things ain't no mistake. I just slapped you three times. That ain't no mistake. You folks caught me in the church office. And I'm getting people's names and information about them. And I come to the pulpit. God said, <laughs> somebody in here named Gladys Johnson, born, what are you saying, God? March 1, 1968. God said, that you got on red today, and God say, he gonna heal your left toe if you put another 
$20,000 in the offering. And you got a son named Isaac. You got a daughter named Mildred. <laughs> and I think your grandmother's name is Harriet. Why should I give you $20,000 to tell me my name? I know my name. Why should I give you $20,000 to tell me my daughter's name and son? I know their name. I'm the one that named them. And we, we try to act like that's coming from God. No, you were in the church office. So let's be real. Let's be honest. Let's have integrity because what you're doing is wrong, it's low down, and you're not coming back to the word never again because you are a criminal. Don't say crook. I tried to make it sound a little bit better. So I'm saying, when we talk about respect, in the song by Aretha Franklin, let's do it across the board. Because as a minister of the gospel of Christ, I am responsible to help resurrect other people's dead stuff. Your life is messed up. You've been on drugs. You've been an alcoholic. You've had problems. You are a f famous football player, famous in some other area, and you have tr troubles and difficulties behind the scenes. People see you playing basketball, but they don't know the struggle you got with drug addiction. They don't know the struggle you have with how you grew up. They don't know that. My job is to help you to have a safe place to come. So that when you talk to me behind the scenes or in public, you are safe. My job, your job, is to resurrect something in somebody else's life. Your job ain't just to, you know, I'm getting all this from God. No, your job as saints of God is to be a blessing in somebody else's life, to let them know what God can do for them, for you to pray for them, lay hands on them, send them an encouragement call or something so that they can come back from the brink of destruction. We've got preachers and pastors committing suicide today. So we, we need help too. So we've got to be a safe place for everyone. Some of you in here today, you're visitors. You need a safe place for you to come so your family can have a safe place to worship and praise. And when we meet you after service and walk you to your car or talk to you in the lobby, it is a safe place for your stuff to be resurrected from the dead. That's real ministry. So Ezekiel, all of this death is here. Total destruction. And Ezekiel says, he, he prophesies now, verse 7, verse 8, 9, 10, he prophesies and does what God says. And Ezekiel says, when I beheld, lo, the sinews in the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. He talks about, behold, there was a noise and there was a shaking and bone came together. Remember, this is not a graveyard. Now bones are coming together. Bone to his bone. All that noise and shaking. But there was no breath in them. Listen, word. Just because there's a lot of activity and noise and clapping doesn't mean God is there. Just because somebody riding around in a fancy car don't mean God is there. Just because somebody can get up here and sing don't mean God is there. Just because somebody can get in your face and run their mouth and say it don't mean God is there. Just because there's a whole lot of folk in a church don't mean God is there. You can have a lot of noise and shaking and bones coming together. But if there is no breath of God, if there is no spirit of God, Lord, thank you for the word being a place of your spirit. Thank you for the word being a place where you have breathed upon the congregation. Breathe upon us now, God. Breathe upon our need for your resurrection. Breathe upon us with the spirit of communion where we can commune with you, God. I don't want just noise, but I want God to really be there. 
I don't want you to be sitting beside me on a pew and you just clapping, but I want God's presence and anointing to be in you so you can reach over and touch me and cancer leaves my body. Diabetes leave my body. I want you to make the headache leave my body. I want to know that if I'm sitting near you, something good is probably going to happen to me because you are there. Because we got to be brought back from the dead. From the very beginning, God was saying, your life is in my hand. John 1, all things were made by him. He made life. He made a way out for you. He made the possibility of not just creating your body and mind and everything else, but he created a way from the beginning to help us to survive, to make it, and to thrive. Bishop talked about paying off the church. There's money in Cincinnati, in Fairfield. Some of you are sitting on $3 million right now. Don't nobody know but you and God. You got money? Bishop Brazier in Chicago built a church that seats almost 4,000. They've got 20-some thousand members. They paid the church off in 10 months. There's a church in D.C. that I saw that cost $28 million. One of the members of the church wrote a check. All right, word, start writing your check. Some of you folks, God's trying to release the blessings for this church through you. Some of you, God is saying, what I'm about to do, Victor talked about it, the ridiculous blessing, the blessing beyond words that I'm about to do to you, I'm going to trust you with it because you're going to sow into this ministry heavily under the anointing of God. Even today, we, every one of us in here, we need to bring an offering to God. Today, we've already given someone put some money down. I'm going to put some more down. But we need to give a financial offering to God. But I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about you offer to God yourself. Give God yourself, your spirit, your mind, your heart, your will. And God can resurrect stuff. People will see it resurrected. And God will open up the windows of heaven for you. Even if you don't have money, God will bless you in other ways. But you need money to keep a business going. But without money, he still can bless you. You can lay hands on this pulpit, lay hands on this stage, and say, God, I want you to open up blessings today. I want you to do, even if you don't have it, God opens up somebody else's pocket. But you're all being blessed. So let's give God an offering. Lord, before communion, I give myself to you. I recommit myself to you. I give you my heart, my praise, my lips, my word, my strength. I give myself to you, God, because you gave me a resurrection from the dead. Some of us had food stamps. Some of us ate bologna all the time. Some of us had government cheese. We didn't always go to Papa Dole's. And don't be ashamed. No, I ain't going to let nobody know that I had that powdered government milk. Well, I survived on that government milk. And I'm standing before you today because God gave me a resurrection. Now that I can do better, my offering is going to be better. My money giving is going to be better. My praise is going to be better. My worship is going to be better. Me treating you right is going to be better. Me getting committed to this ministry is going to be better because God made me better. In your life, in closing, son of man, woman, can your bones live? The devil says, no way. She doesn't even know where her leg bone is. She doesn't know where her thigh bone is. He doesn't even know where the cartilage is. You don't have to know. When God tells you to speak and prophesy unto these bones and you do what God did, wherever the bone is, 
Wherever your daughter is that you've been praying to come back home, wherever your son is messed up on drugs, wherever your uncle is and you ain't seen him in nine years, God will start bringing bone to his bone and reconnecting. God will start bringing stuff back together. You don't have to go look for everything, but God, I send your angel. I send your spirit. Find my child. Bring my child back. Don't let the drugs kill her. I want to see her again. And God will start bringing stuff back together. Lord, my mind is not straight. I'm not thinking right. And God starts putting brain cells back into your head. But they said, my, my red blood count and my white blood count, God starts putting new red blood cells in you, new white blood cells in you. Well, well where did the new white blood cells come from? Where did the first ones come from? They all came from God. You testify about how God gave you a new liver. Where did the new liver come from? Where did the old liver come from? The God that made all things, he made the new liver and the old liver. And if God can make the body that you were born with, he can redo the body that you got and put life back in you. You can live. In 2 Kings 4, 34 and 35, there was a boy that was raised from the dead. In 1 Kings 17, verse 21 to 23, there was another boy that the prophet raised from the dead. 2 Kings 13 and 21, the prophet was already dead. They took a man, he was dead, threw him into the tomb. He touched the tomb of the, the, the prophet and he got up from the dead. In Luke 7, 14 and 15, there's a processional going on for a funeral. Jesus sees it. He walks by, touches the casket, and that boy, he gets up from the dead. In Acts 9 and 40, Tabitha or Dorcas was raised from the dead. In Acts 20 and 10, Eutychus was raised from the dead. In John 11, 43 and 44, Lazarus was raised from the dead. 1,947 years later, after Lazarus was raised, I got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, and I got raised from the dead. And you got raised from the dead. And you got raised from the dead. And you got raised from the dead. Your hopes and dreams were raised from the dead. But watch this. But none of those people had a resurrection. Because when Lazarus, you get to John 12, after Lazarus is raised in the 12th chapter, they're plotting to see how they can kill him all over again. Just because you got blessed and you got happy and you feeling all good, don't think your enemies ain't trying to come back. They say, oh yeah, we're we going to stop you from shouting. We're going to stop you from raising your hand. We're going to get you again. But not once I've been resurrected. See, I didn't say God was going to just raise stuff. He's going to resurrect you. Resurrect means I live never to die again. You, once I've been resurrected by the Holy Ghost, I'm not going back to drugs again. I'm not going back to alcohol again. I'm not going to let you depress me again. I'm not going to miss church three weeks in a row because you didn't speak to me. I'm not going to let that happen anymore. My spirit's been resurrected. My mind's been resurrected. I live to never die. I'm not dying anymore. My dreams are no longer dying. My hopes are no longer dying. My son is not going to flunk out of college. You are not going to come into my house and act a fool. I got a resurrection from the dead. This ministry has had a resurrection. You have had a resurrection. That's why money will come. Healing will come. Deliverance will come. Joy will come. Worship will come. Because God resurrected you and gave you permanent life. You're never going to stop feeling the anointing of God in this place. The choir is never going to stop being anointed in this place. You're never going to have the glory of God depart from this place. When God gave you a resurrection, there's nothing the devil can ever do to make you die again. A resurrection from the dead. Why? Because God is the one that said to Bishop Hilton, prophesy to the winds. North, east, south, west. Choir, you're beautiful. You men and women sang well. And God is saying, I'm releasing blessings 
that are going to come from the north, east, south, and west. The devil said, no, no, I'm going to block it from the east. It don't matter because it's still going to come from the west. I'm going to block it from the south. God still got it coming from the north. You can't stop God from getting to me. He's going to find a way to get to me. He's going to breathe upon, just breathe on somebody. I release God's blessings. I release God's healing. Where's, where's Bishop Hilton's sister? I release healing into your body. God says, you shall live and not die. We release healing, and when we release it to you, you're going to be healed. Your cousin's going to get healed. Your grandmother's going to get healed. When you pray for somebody else, you will be healed. A resurrection. Stand with me. I'm done. I just feel, I just feel to just worship God. Do you, let's just give him some worship right now. I don't mean praise, but let's worship him before communion. Let's just release worship into this atmosphere. A resurrection from God. I've been resurrected. You didn't just bring me back to die again, but Lord, I bless your name. Let your spirit of resurrection rest upon this congregation. Let your winds blow upon this congregation. Let your glory encapture us. Let your arms envelop us, God. Let us release worship to you. We worship you, God. We adore you now. We give you honor. We magnify you, God. Let your glory rest in this place now. We have a resurrection, God. We're not just coming back for a period of time, but we're going to keep on going. We're going to keep getting better, keep getting stronger. We'll use our help to magnify you. We'll use our money to magnify you. We'll use the strength on our feet and legs and arms to magnify you. We'll use our automobile to magnify you. We'll go to college to magnify you. We'll go back to night school to magnify you. We will bless you on our job. We will bless you in our home. We will give glory to you, God. Let's just give him some worship today. Open your mouth and worship this God that we're about to commune with. You want God to give you something in communion? Let's give him something. Let's release it to him. Let's give it to him. Let's give him worship. Let's give him adoration. We worship you, God, before the communion. We commune with you. We open our spirits to you. We open our hearts to you. We give you the ability to speak to us, and we will hear you, God, and we will speak to the bones that are in our life. We will speak to the dryness that's in our life, and we will see you cause a resurrection, God. Breathe upon us now, and let your glory rest. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right, just talk to him. Just for a moment, just talk to him. Your resurrection, just talk to him. We're going to commune with you, Lord, because you came to us first. From the very beginning, you had us in mind. You made all things, and that included me. And you made this moment and this day of communion for us to be able to be with you in your presence. Come, Bishop. We give you honor today, Lord. And we thank you that at some point in our life, you spoke to us and asked us, can these bones live? And we said to you, we don't know, but we know that you knew, God. And when we arrive home today, whether we're in the choir or on the main floor, we're going to see the fruit of resurrection power. On Wednesday of this week, we're going to see the fruit of resurrection power. I didn't just come back. I've been resurrected. I've been made new. And I cannot ever die again. Give God praise as your bishop comes in Jesus' name.
this house today. Have you received it? Have you received it? Have you received it? As you continue to worship, we're going to flow right into this communion. So the word of God says in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, in the 23rd verse, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do remember the Lord's death till he come. The Father, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. We bless your name. We bless your name. We thank you, O oh God, for the giving of your Son. We thank you, O oh God, that your Son gave his life. We thank you, O oh God, that he was resurrected from the dead. And God, we thank you for resurrecting us, for raising us up to the place where we should be for you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. And as we come before this table of remembrance, in the name of Jesus, Bless this bread, bless this cup, bless this drink. In the name of Jesus, let not a one take unworthily. Oh God, any sin committed, let it be remitted now. In the name of Jesus, let lives be changed, let souls be saved. We do this in remembrance of our Savior, our King. Jesus Christ, we bless you now. We bless you now. We give you glory. We give you honor. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we declare it. Amen. Amen. The blood that Jesus
Jesus, we strengthen. 